Good morning. Our verse for call to worship this morning, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collections be made when I come. Let's sing together. Would you stand with me? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. 463 in your book, if you'd like. 463, blessed assurance. <clears throat> chapter 9, if you'll follow, as I tackle verses 6 through 15. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always, having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality which through us is providing thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. Because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution to them and to all. 
while they also, by prayer on your behalf, yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. As we continue in song 374 in your book, if you like, 374, Be Thou My Vision.
Dismissed to Junior Church at this time. I guess. It's all right. We are heading to the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 16. So uh, I'll have it on there, but if you like your Bible, that's where to head. Um, I am from. Boonville, Indiana. I wasn't born there, but that's the first place I remember. Boonville is the very bottom of Indiana, not far from Evansville. Um, frankly, a couple of cornfields and a swim across the Ohio, and you're in Kentucky. But being a native-born Hoosier, I'm very, very proud of those two cornfields in between me and Kentucky. And uh, it's incumbent on a Hoosier to tell Kentuckian jokes, and so I don't want to let my people down. Um, as we talk about giving and church government, a uh, story is told of a little church in the hills of Kentucky, and uh, they had a business meeting, and a fellow raised his hand, and he made a motion, and he says, I, motion, I give a motion forth that we buy new chandeliers for the meeting house. Fell in the back row, spoke right up out of turn, says, I'm against it. The preacher says, well, why? He says, well, a couple reasons. He says, first of all, we ain't got nobody what can spell it. Second of all, we ain't got nobody what can play it. And third of all, we need new lights in the meeting house. Uh, but you never know. Um, there's another story told. Little bitty church, pastor was having a tough day. One of the things that was personally just a little bit irritating to him was he was missing his go-to piano player. And uh, he didn't have his usual keyboardist, and he had somebody he'd never met before at, at piano or organ. Maybe it was organ, forgive me. And... Um, you know, they made their way through, and, and they did all right, and um, that, that was okay. But at the end of the meeting, they were having a pledge drive, and they wanted people to pledge towards their new building project. And that new organist became his favorite organist when he made the announcement, everybody who will pledge $1,000 to the church building, please rise. And she started to play the national anthem. How to make the preacher happy. Um, we leave the subject of giving alone too often. Uh, if you know me, I'm a book study guy. I, I like to make my way through a book. That's probably 90% of my preaching. Uh, and typically, I don't talk about, you know, I don't do a lot of topical things. And some, usually topics that are somewhat difficult, like tithing, giving to the church, I cover them when we get to them. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 is one of those giving passages. Uh, there's more in 2 Corinthians about our giving than there is in 1 Corinthians, but there's plenty here. And so we're going to address the passage at hand, and we're going to move on, and we're going to talk a little bit more broadly about giving because we're in one of those passages. Uh, why don't we preach about giving? Well, it seems self-serving sometimes. The church pays the pastor. The church pays the pastor based on how much money comes in. They can't pay him what they don't have. I have never had to take a pay cut here. I'm grateful for that. I know a lot of pastors who've taken pay cuts. Maybe the church gave them a little too much raise, or maybe things just, they, they had a, a setback, but I've known several pastors, some of them that don't live far from here, that had to give money back. I've never had to do that. I've also never had my paycheck bounce. Although years ago, when Rose was the treasurer, there were weeks where she said to me, Pastor, would you please wait until at least Wednesday before you cast your check, because it was that kind of close. Praise the Lord, we haven't been that kind of close, probably in close to a decade. God's been very kind, and we've got enough padding in there that we don't panic, and I can cash my check tomorrow morning when the bank opens, and that's all good. I'm happy about it. But one of the things that was in the passage that we read for, the supporting passage that we read for Scripture reading, is that our giving is a thanksgiving to God, and that our giving is therefore worship to God, and that our giving glorifies God. 
He's talking in both that passage in 2 Corinthians and in this passage in 1 Corinthians, he's talking about a specific offering that's to really to relieve, it's a relief offering for a church on the other side of the Mediterranean for most of these churches. He's talking about the churches, he's talking to the churches in greater Greece, Macedonia, and what we would call Turkey today, the Galatian region, southern Turkey. He's it, he, if you go through Paul's writings, he's taking collections from them to help the believers out in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, they're on hard times. There's a lot of reasons. In your notes, I put drought. And boy, we've gotten pretty dry. I don't remember the last time it was this kind of dry around here. Uh, you know, even those lilacs that take over my front yard, they're dying. And even the weeds that take over my backyard, they're dying. And it's, it's, water's been hard to come by. Uh, but there was severe drought and, a, and an accompanying famine that came to Israel in general and Jerusalem in particular. I also give politics as a reason. Remember the politics of Jerusalem. They had the person who had Pilate's job. He was the Roman governor because this was been colonized and been taken over by the Romans. You had a puppet king. They called him the Herod. There were several different Herods. And so you had a puppet king who they called Herod and then you had the governor who took Pontius Pilate's job and it was hard for, they had to make Rome happy and they had to keep the Jews happy. And you know, one of the things that they could do that made the Romans happy and the Jewish population happy was to pick on the Christians. And so this first generation church in, in the first couple hundred years, the first century of the church, this was not an easy time to be a believer in Jerusalem. And so in the same way that it happens today, People in an area that were doing fine financially gave sacrificially to help brothers and sisters that they had never met in the Jerusalem church. And Paul in our scripture reading talked about what an incredible testimony of what God is doing in you. And he says, you know what the flip side of that is? Those saints, they've never met you in their world. They'll probably never see you in their life. But they're going to pray for you from now on. Isn't that awesome? This ministry of one church helping another church was, was tying people together in ways that just didn't happen, especially in their day and age. I mean, even in my lifetime, you're dating yourself, Haman, even in my lifetime, mission work has radically changed. And when I was a kid, missionaries that went overseas, they always told these stories about you know, eating goat size and monkey brains for dinner because you didn't want to offend your host. And I've got to be honest, it's part of why, why I didn't go into ministry. I, I'm, I'm a picky eater. I didn't want to eat goat eyes and monkey brain. Um, I had no desire at all. People would go and they would stay five years, seven years, and then they come home for a year on furlough. A lot of the time, even in my day, even though planes were plentiful, uh, a lot of times people would take a boat. They would take, they would ship, and then. If they, didn't, if they didn't go by boat, all their material goods went in barrels and got shipped to them that way. Now, probably about half of our missionary stable, if you will, our missionary family, probably about half of them live in the States and travel in and out of the countries in which they minister. And even those who serve overseas have things like Skype and Zoom and so forth, and, and there's a relationship that there's never been before. It's amazing. Uh, Richard Dochimo Sr. came to a men's breakfast one time when Michalina was in Bangladesh, and he, she, she called him, and he's telling all about it, and, it, and she told me about it later, and she kept saying, Daddy, you gotta back up, Daddy, you gotta back up, Daddy, you gotta back up. Finally, you know, he was so excited to see her and hear her, finally, Daddy, you gotta back up. All I can see is your nose. Know, you know, but Skype, it's a new world out there. It just is. In their day, they didn't have Skype. How fun has it been, the last two VBS closings, to get Tommy Jackson on the wall and tell him what we raised for camp 2001 year and 1100 and something the next? That's been a blast for me to be able to see him. A camp isn't far away, but he can't just jump down here. Uh, that's awesome. So this ministry was a relief. We see this somewhat. We see it even in the states. Isn't it interesting how often when the southern United States has flooding, the north has droughts, and somebody in the middle has a perfect growing season? 
and to watch people help each other out. It warms my heart to see American help American out, and it delights my soul to see American brothers helping other American brothers out in Christ. That's the, that's the underline that we're talking about. I think there are a lot of truths in these passages in First and Second Corinthians that apply to all of our giving, but here, this is a relief offering that's being talked about. Now, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8 says, Then they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense of it and caused them to understand the reading. So they read clearly and plainly. They explained the sense of what they were reading, and they kept explaining to help the other people come to understand it. And it was pointed out to me long ago that that's good preaching. We're giving what the word says, we're giving the sense of it, we're causing people to understand it both academically and also to understand how it applies. Are you hearing me all right? This died, we need to buy some because all of our um, stash has gone fluid. I'll stay close to this one and we'll see what we get. I don't think that's any better, is it? Nope. Right in front of the mic, I'll stay. Um, I'm going to try with the passage itself here kind of on the top half of your one-page handout. You notice the one-page handout? Don't get excited. You're not getting out early. Maybe a little earlier than last week, but you're not going to be out of here before noon. You know me better than that by now. Um, but uh, anyway, pastors are funny. When you go and you're a guest speaker, a guest speaker, uh, an acquaintance of mine, told my brother-in-law, Pastor Kenny, one time, he was speaking in the evening service. He said, service starts at 6. It's over at 7, and the sidewalks roll up at 7.15. In other words, not only do I want you done on time, I don't want you talking to my people late at night and keeping me stuck here at church. I'm going to go home. I thought that was a little, I thought that was a little bit rude myself. Uh, other pastors, I know one pastor said, listen, the bulletin says we're out of here at noon. If you end before 10 minutes after, you're in trouble with me because I don't want people to think it can be done. That might be my camp. Uh, but we're going to give in the first half here the sense of the passage and cause you to understand it. That's the goal here. Uh, so in our passage, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save, as he may prosper, so that no collections be made when I come. When I arrive, whomever you may approve, I will send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And if it is fitting for me to go also, they will go with me. Now concerning, in these last several chapters of 1 Corinthians, whenever we see that little couplet of words, that little phrase, now concerning, Paul, most would agree, most people studying it out, is answering Corinthian questions. There's trading letters back and forth. If you don't know what it is to trade a letter back and forth, ask your parents or your grandparents. But they're sending letters back and forth, and it takes a while to hear back, and so you might send a a list of letters, or a list of questions, and then they'll send back a list of answers. This last half of the book, that's a lot of what Paul's doing. That phrase, now concerning, is repeated, and so he's answering their questions about giving for the relief of the Jerusalem saints. He says, now concerning the collection. The collection, it's money. And so there are many reasons, and many times, and many opportunities that a church will collect money. In this immediate context, again, it's a relief of believers they've never met before. Um, our ladies, at the end of you know the, the Ukraine invasion happened early in the year, uh, towards the end of ladies' Bible study and Naomi, and our ladies wanted to know, how can we help believers in Ukraine? That's the sense of this, isn't it? We're doing fine. We don't have, I mean, it's a little weird around here these last few years, but we're not blowing up things and not, we're not being blown up and so we're not in any like anything like and no matter what you think of the political anything of what's going on in Ukraine and how guiltless or guilty the Ukraines are as a people or you know their leadership we have brothers and sisters over there and they need help and so we did the best we could to find ways through our fellowship 
through people that we know and trust, people that will get the money there the most that we can. I'm a bang for the buck kind of guy. I don't like ministries where all the, there's too much money gets taken off the top. As much of my money that gets where it's going to serve the Lord, that's what I want to do. And so the collection, they were raising money. For the saints, and again, this money was for hurting believers in Jerusalem. They were on particularly hard times, and in their day, a drought meant a famine, and a famine meant dying. They couldn't just ship their... Uh, what happens around here when we have a drought? We pay more for our food. We don't go hungry. We don't generally lose weight. We just pay more for our food, and we're watching it all around us. In their day, they died. A drought would kill people. A drought would kill animals. And so this was for the saints in Jerusalem. He says, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. So do the same as I instructed the Galatian churches. He says this a couple different places, and here's some reasons. One, this was a shared endeavor. Not only, as 2 Corinthians 9 developed, did this knit together the Corinthian church with the Jerusalem church, even across the Mediterranean, and it, it had believers praying for believers that they'd never met before. Not only that, but it reached across the Aegean, or the Adriatic. I get my A's mixed up. If I flip that, you'll forgive me. But over into Turkey as well, in the churches of Galatia. And so this is much of the known world, and the believers in much of the known world are looking out for each other, and it's knitting them together, if you will, vertically and horizontally, if you're looking at the Mediterranean map. Also, Paul wasn't asking something of the Corinthians that he wasn't asking of other people. This matters for a couple reasons. Underlying these two letters that we have to Corinth, back to Corinth, is this. Paul was being attacked. He was being demeaned. His authority, even his apostleship, was being questioned by a certain group of people in the Corinthian church. He was purposefully not as well-spoken and, and, and as exciting a speaker as he could have been. He was purposefully simplistic. I determined to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. The simplicity of the gospel was everything in Paul's ministry, especially early on in Corinth. And then they had Apollos, and I mean Apollos could preach. Apollos could turn a phrase. That man had a voice. He was an orator. Uh, last week, forgive me if you were waiting for the YouTube, it was me. It took me forever. I had to download a new version of my software, and I, I don't know what was so weird, but we're glad you're back home here. We really are. And glad that Steve and Nina are feeling better. Keep praying them better. Uh, but one, you know what the hardest thing is about it when I have to do the video? I have to listen to myself. I, I apologize. I'm sorry to the rest of you. I'm, I'm sure you're used to it, but oh, ugh, I just, I don't like listening. Um, he must like the sound of his own voice. Well, maybe in his head, but not on a recording. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, Paul didn't come with a lot of pizzazz, and that was on purpose. He wanted it to be about Christ and the cross, Christ and the cross, Christ and the cross. And so they're questioning him. And so he wants them to know that while they have him back on his heels, and there's a certain level of self-defense that's, that's here in these, bo in these books for us, letters for them, that he's not picking on them because they're picking on him. Also, if you go back way to the beginning, Corinth was in the middle of a skinny little isthmus that, that connected mainland Greece and Macedonia with the Peloponnesus. The Peloponnesus is that bottom of Greece that's just about an island except for this little skinny isthmus of Corinth that ties it together. And so because it was the middle of the land bridge between the mainland and more or less an island, it was an incredibly populous place and they made money hand over fist in trade. And people would roll and now there's a, there's a canal through there. People go from Aegean to Adriatic, from Adriatic to Aegean without going down around the bottom of Greece, around Malta, where the, the seas are horrible down there. And so this was a busy place. They made money hand over fist. This was a well-to-do church. We have sister churches that I find are particularly careful with their benevolence fund, their deacons fund, uh, or what they may call it, because they're wealthy churches. And they feel that there's a lot of people that try to take advantage of them because they're wealthy churches. 
I, I think that's beside the point. It's, it has a lot more to do with the need of the, of the person who needs the gift than it does with the wealth of the person who's giving the gift. Uh, but I see, practically speaking, how they get there, they felt taken advantage of at times. Um, but here he says, do the same as I told the Galatian churches. And then notice here, on the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. On the first day of the week. He talks about that in our second Corinthians passage as well. On the first day of the week. A, they were worshiping on Sunday, not on Saturday the Sabbath, but on the resurrection day on Sunday. This makes it very plain. And so part of this was corporately do your giving on Sunday. Um, I used to get in trouble all the time on prayer meeting night because I'd forget to pass the plate. I've been in church all of my life. I've been in churches very much like this one all of my life. You know what I've never seen? I've never seen an offering plate passed on a Wednesday night except at Pilgrim. Just haven't seen it. Uh, why? Well, because most of the people that are there on Wednesday night already did their giving on Sunday. It's not wrong. And now we have a basket, and there's since COVID, and it's different, there's very, very little that comes in on a Wednesday night, and most of it does come in on Sunday. And you know how that is. Half of it comes in after the basket comes up to the counter's office. That's the nature of it for our poor counters. Uh, but, you know, it's fine. And I, I personally, the box things kind of, I kind of like it. I'll be on, honest with you there, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a moment. Uh, but each one of you, this was an individual responsibility as well as a corporate responsibility. He's giving instructions to the church at large, but part of that is to the individual. And so take, take up your collection first on the first day of the week. That's their day of worship but it's also a matter of set it aside soon so that it's not a matter of it has somewhere else to go at the end of your week. If you talk to any secular financial counselor, they're gonna tell you, pay yourself first. What they mean by that is put money in your savings, whether it's your rainy day emergency fund, your retirement fund, etc. Put money in your savings first because if you wait until after all the bills are paid, and you've eaten what you wanted to eat, and you've bought what you wanted to buy, and you've gone where you wanted to go, guess how much is left over for your savings? Zippy. That's how that goes. So they say pay yourself first. Dear Christian, may I add to that, as the Bible adds to that, pay God first, then pay yourself second. My order after that, make sure you got a roof over your head, a way to get from that roof to your workplace and food to eat and then go down from there. Um, I taught in Christian school. Boy, did we have to prioritize things when we were paid like that. Uh, but uh, first payment always, roof over the head. After we take care of the Lord, roof over the head. Um, I was never very good at that paying myself second part. There just wasn't any there. That's the nature. But he told them priority and set it aside. I, there's a Christian that I know and love and respect in the Lord that I overheard explaining to somebody one time how they did it. And they said that they, everything they had left over at the end of the week they gave to the Lord. Now there are two things wrong with that. I think it missed the purpose or the, the procedure here of paying the Lord first. I also think that what I heard from this person is that they weren't setting anything aside for themselves for an emergency fund, for retirement, for anything. Savings is a good idea. That's part of stewardship. I don't think we should avoid that. And I think we ought to put God first because he asks it of us. We're going to talk about proportions here in a moment. But on the first day of the week, again, each one of you, it's a corporate as well as an individualist uh, um, responsibility. Put aside and save. Set the money aside for this purpose. Um, many of you know my in-laws. And uh, I respect them very highly. And Pastor Shatney... If you knew how much money he made and you saw their house, you would wonder how in the world he did it. I'll tell you how he did it. He did it by being cheap. Not really. He did it by being frugal and clever. The man is very clever. He's got good sense. He knows how not to waste money. He is very, very, very good at not wasting money. And because of that, he's able to do things. And in later, in later years, he's, he's lived for the last... 30 years with no mortgage. He's had the house paid for since 92. And so no mortgage. And so what has he done? 
he's made his car payment to his savings account. So instead of paying interest, you know how you get all that interest up front and it's nasty interest and it goes up and down with prime and all that stuff? He's put it in the bank and made a check, made a payment to the bank and then goes to the dealership and writes the dealer a check. It's amazing how much more you can do and how much less you'll pay for it if you can do such things. Good stewardship is good stewardship. Each one of you put aside and save as he may prosper. This is to be proportionate to income. Uh, we're going to develop that just a little bit as we talk in, more in general about giving in a minute. But it's proportionate. The word tithe is not in the New Testament. Paul doesn't use it. Jesus doesn't use it. Peter, John don't use it. James doesn't use it. It's not in the New Testament. The word tithe means a tenth. In the Old Testament, they were taught they were to give it the tenth part, one-tenth, ten percent, of whatever they earned. The Pharisees went so far as to tithe their spices. You know what that means. Take all your black, go home. Take all your black pepper. Dump it out. Divide it into ten equal parts. Put one of those parts in a cup and take it to the Lord. Put the rest right back in. They would tithe their spices. The Bible never says to tithe your spices. They were going above and beyond on something that was easy for them to do because they were neglecting a lot of obedient uh, areas of obedience in their Christian walk or their spiritual walk, as it were. Um, set it aside. The idea of a tenth is a good idea. I, I think it makes sense. It's been well said that tithe robs no man. 10% uh, of a lot, 10% of a little, there's still a sensibility to it. We'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute. Put aside and save. As he may prosper, give proportionately to your income. L.G. Letourneau was very famous, a very gifted businessman, blessed of the Lord, uh, built kind of a financial empire. He was good about his tithing, and finally he got convicted about it. He says, Lord, 10% of what you've blessed me with is more than enough for me to live on. If you're going to keep providing for me like this, I'm going to start giving you the 90 and living on the 10. And Christian colleges all over America have buildings with his name on it because God blessed him remarkably, and he kept giving to the Lord. There's a school that a Christian engineering school bears his name in Texas because God blessed him as he gave the 90 and kept the 10. As we prosper, as we do a little better, we are, for ourselves, we can do a little better in our giving for the Lord and for others as we may prosper. And he says, so that no collections be made when I come. Plan ahead and prioritize. This is a good area to plan ahead and prioritize. Not where it's just the leavings, the gleanings, that little bit I have left in my wallet at the end of the week. Um, I, don't, I won't ask for hands. Many of you have probably been like me, maybe, and you use the cash in an envelope system at least one time in your life. Uh, it's good advice. If you really struggle with credit, if you struggle with doing the math, if you set aside in an envelope what you're allowed for groceries, what you're allowed for gas, if you pay for your gas with cash, please don't do it in front of me. It takes way too long. But if, if you struggle otherwise, you know, that cash in an envelope system, it's not the worst idea ever. And uh, I know a lot of people who've really gotten their financial house back in order by using cash in an envelope. And only, you know, if it's not there, I, don't, I can't spend it. Uh, but... The idea is we don't want to take the leavings and give it to the Lord. We want to give him the first fruits. We've talked about first fruits in regard to resurrection. We've talked about it in general. The first fruits offering was that little bit that said, Lord, you have blessed me and let me give back to you. And I'm giving back to you first because I know you, I know how you've been to me, and I know there's plenty more where that came from. So our passage at hand, collecting for the saints in Jerusalem, Set it aside early, make it a priority before money has a way of disappearing. There's always something tugging on it. You know, you got to keep your car running, you got to keep your kids fed, somebody's out growing their shoes, and there's all sorts of things that can tug money in any number of directions. Prioritize it, put it up front, set it aside early so that it's not a scramble. And covetousness is when, at the end of the week, you know, I'm, I'm down to my last 10 spot, and boy, I'd like it for something else. And uh, the money shouldn't squeak as it leaves our hand. Giving in general. Our giving to the Lord should be planned. Our passage, 1 Corinthians 16, 2, lay aside on the first day of each week, each one of us. Forethought shows that we care. We plan ahead. That shows it matters to us. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 5, So I thought it necessary to urge the brethren that they would go on ahead to you and arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gift 
so that the same would be ready as a bountiful gift and not affected by covetousness. In other words, these men came to remind you and to help facilitate this so that you wouldn't forget about it and so that you wouldn't be scrambling at the last minute because you had good intentions and he's kind of encouraging their good intentions to keep on in the right direction. Forethought shows our priorities and it avoids temptation. Our giving needs to be private. It needs to be as private as we can make it. Matthew 6, 1 through 4, part of the Sermon on the Mount. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. This is in a greater passage that talks about live your Christian life in secret. Don't make a big deal if you're fasting and, and you're trying to, to you know center your thoughts on a decision and looking for the leading of the Lord and you're fasting. Don't wear it on your face. Don't tell everybody that'll listen. Uh, make it a private thing. If you're going to do something and help somebody out, don't toot your horn and let everybody else know about it. Do it privately. And the beautiful thing is those things that you do secretly, that you don't do to be seen of men, that you do as privately as situations allow you to, those are the things that God will bless. Those are the things that God will reward. If you do it full throttle, as publicly as you can make it to be seen of men, I hope you enjoyed being seen of men because the scripture just told us that's all you're going to get. There's no reward in heaven waiting for that. Um, I like private giving. I have to be terribly honest with you. I kind of like that box in the back. I know it's a little bit of a pain for the counters, like I said, because so many times folk, and it's na nature, we don't remember until we're on the way out and so forth. Um, we don't have much coming and going upstairs. We, we basically, other than the morning, from, from you know, a half an hour before Sunday school until a half an hour after morning service, that's all we use this room for these days. Uh, but part of me would like to have a, a, a well-constructed lock box there during the week and people can be really secret. As it is, if you're tricky, you, know, you can still get in that mail slot pretty easily without anybody noticing you. And uh, we don't stand and stare. But let your giving be just as very private as you can make it. I've seen the reverse. In First Baptist North Conway, it's a beautiful old church. It's kind of a small auditorium, and it's got those little bitty numbered pews because people used to buy their pews. That was their giving back in the day. And I remember one of our ladies, we had three widows that would sit together towards the back, and one of those ladies, she would roll her $1 bills into a little tube. And so when I was on the count, what we would call counting committee, you had to unroll it and flatten it and straighten it and unroll it and flatten it and straighten it and get it to stay. But she'd roll it up so at least nobody knew what it was. But, but that would be all right if she was trying to be private with those $1 bills. But, but she had to somehow, to get it, they, they passed like a, um, I guess they passed a plate there. My dad's old church had a pouch. Always got a kick out of that. But as the plate went by, she didn't put, you know, the plate went down under the pew level and the giving could have just been into it. But somehow to get it in the plate down here, she had to lift it up here. And, and sometimes I think she was going to make Michael Jordan proud with a nice windmill, you know, and uh, put it in there. What's she saying? Look at me, look at me, look at me. Dear friend, that's all there is for reward if that's what's being done. All of it, our prayer time, our devotional time, how we deal with the fast, how we deal with the hard time, how we deal with our giving. The more private we can make it, the more God is going to bless it. And so our giving should be very private. Um, and Matthew 6, 1 tells us all about it. It needs to be as private as we can make it. It needs to be proportionate and it needs to be sacrificial. Mark 12, 42, a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which amount to a cent. Calling his disciples to him, he said to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury, for they all put in out of their surplus, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she owned, all she had to live on. Now, 
I don't think, I think you need to be careful and not misunderstand. The Lord is not saying to be irresponsible and to always give away your grocery money, your rent money, and then wonder why you don't have anything to eat and you don't have anywhere to live. Uh, good stewardship includes taking care of yourself, bearing your own burden before you bear somebody else's. Even though you're supposed to bear somebody else's, you don't want to become a burden to somebody else altogether. And so this lady, though, she's an example because she was poor. She had no income. She was a widow. She had no husband providing for her. And in their culture, that was huge. A, there were a lot of them, and B, it was very hard for them. The, the synagogue, the, the Jewish synagogue, had taken care of the widows in days past, and now the church needed to step up and do that. And so the New Testament talks to us very specifically about the how-tos and taking care of widows who are truly widows, who are widows indeed, and so forth. But it was proportionate. Her one cent in two small coins was a tiny, tiny, tiny gift monetarily. We're talking lots of decimal points, you know, on the right side. And there are other people that came and they gave a lot more money than she did. But because they possessed so much more, as he says, they gave out of their surplus. They never even missed it. For her, that was going to make life tight, that penny, more or less, that she put in. That was going to make life tight. And so the Lord said she gave more than any of them because the giving wasn't measured by the amount, but it was measured by the proportion. And so our giving needs to be proportionate to what, we're, what we've been blessed with. And that ought to, I think, A, a tithe is a great starting point. If you talk about the Old Testament teaching, it was 10% of everything all the time, but there were other offerings on top of that. It was actually better than 30% for people that were true to it and faithful. I'm not saying I give 30%. Um, I haven't figured out how to live on that. Um, but the Old Testament picture, the New Testament does not demand a tithe of it, tithe of us, but I think it's a wonderful pattern in Scripture, and I think the idea of a percentage is a fantastic idea. You've heard me tell the story about the brother that came to his pastor. He says, Pastor, he says, you know, back in the day, I made $200 a week, and I want you to know, Pastor, every Sunday I put a 20 in the offering plate. I was glad to do it. I was glad to do that from my Lord to, to tithe, and out of that $200, I gave him $20 every week. But Pastor, you know I make $2,000 a week now. Pastor, that's a $200 check every Sunday. I don't know how I can do that. Pastor says, okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, please take this brother back to making $200 a week so that he can give faithfully. But, 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 preacher. Um, proportionate proportionate. And I, I see in the passage, as I've looked at it more, it's not just the idea of the percentage of the tithe, but perhaps as God blesses, we could give more than a tithe. I'll be very honest. Our, our church is too small to have this conversation, probably. But we have folk in our church that do more than 10%. We have people that are very, very generous to the Lord's work. And it's a beautiful thing, and we pray, I pray God's every blessing on them. Uh, but as you are led of the Lord, we need to give. It ought to be proportionate. It ought to be faithful. It ought to be a priority. It ought to be done privately. Uh, Acts 4, again, this is in the relief of other believers. Verse 34, for there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called... Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, and who owned a tract of land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And so it tells us what the process was in general, and then it gives us one specific person by name of Barnabas, the son of encouragement, the son of consolation. These people would sell the, you know, in their world, remember, there, there was no middle class. Incidentally, dear American, it's not going to be too long until we're not going to have one either. But there were distinct haves and there were distinct have-nots. And part of the glory that's been America is there's been a lot more in the middle than any other nation state has had and for a long time. But it's disappearing. Uh, but they were very divided to the haves and the have-nots. And in Christ, the haves were selling what they had so that they could help and bail out the have-nots. Let me tell you, apart from Christ, that doesn't help. That doesn't happen very much. This was an amazing, wonderful thing. And we have a positive example of Barnabas given to us even by name in this. 
and then Acts 11.29, and in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them de determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. So here's this sense. As the Lord prospered them, and, and percentage-wise, based on how well they did, they helped out their fellow believers. And so it needs to be proportionate and sacrificial. I have a, a sermon I did with this title, Practical Pointers on Purposeful Giving, and I used all P's. Our giving should be planned, it should be private, it should be proportional, it should be painful, by which I mean sacrificial, but sacrificial doesn't start with P. And then it needs to be pleasant, we'll get there in a moment. That's just fair warning. Think about it before you play categories with a preacher, if you know that game. Preachers who alliterate all the time are dangerous when they have to find all these words that start with the same letter. It just, it's how it works. Uh, but proportionate and sacrificial, our giving should be pleasant. Uh, back to our scripture reading, zeroing in on verse 7. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You remember when you taught your small child how to apologize? Junior, say you're sorry. Junior, say you're sorry. Finally, kid comes up, hands shoved down as deeply as they'll go in his pockets, scowl on his face, eyes furrowed. Sorry. Did that sorry mean anything? Why did he say he was sorry? Because he did not want mom upset with him. And this is every last one of us who's ever had a child, isn't it? And I pick on the boys with the junior, but it's the girls too. We have to learn to apologize. We don't want to. And those arm twisted behind your back, metaphorically, of course, apologies, they don't really mean much, do they? If our giving is with one arm twisted up behind our back, here, Lord, I know you want it. Take it. Is God going to bless that? Is God going to delight in that? Is that going to redound to his glory and praise him? Is that really a thanksgiving if we give it grudgingly or because we have to? We joke about some people that they're so tight with their money, the dollar bill squeaks on its way out. Should that be our giving? No. Generously, proportionately, gladly. Gladly, not grudgingly or of necessity, because God loves the cheerfulness. It should truly be a pleasant thing. Uh, I don't have time. I won't take the time to talk about my own life. But there have been times in my life, in my adult life, in my married life, where I did not tithe like I was supposed to. And God basically said to me, young man, you can hand this to me, or I'm going to take it out your pocket. I had a disproportionate number of engines go in my trucks. Part of that was I was buying trucks at the bottom of the food chain at the end of their life. But let me tell you, there was just too many of them happening for it to be anything else but God teaching me something. And so discipline in giving to the Lord and watching him bless. He's amazing how he teaches us these things. Uh, you want to have a delightful 20 minutes, ask Hector about giving and how God taught him. He and I have swapped stories and... God took the two by four out for him just like he did for me and he's been happy to tell people about it ever since because it was profound to him and God has blessed him in his giving and for his giving since. And it's a wonderful thing to see. I have seen people. There was a man that, that ministered with my father. He was a simple man. He was of simple means. But he had well-to-do relatives that never had kids. He just kept inheriting money. Every time he was bottoming out and he didn't know how he was going to pay his next bill, he'd inherit money. But you know something? Every time he inherited money, he bought Bible books. And if he bought a Bible book for himself, he bought it for his preacher. And then when his preacher's kid went into ministry, he started buying Bible books for me too. What a delight. And God took care of him. And he took care of that man financially, kind of like when Mr. Magoo drives. If you're younger, ask your parents or your grandparents about Mr. Magoo. Mr. Magoo couldn't see. And he was about to drive off a cliff or any number of places. And at the last minute, something happened to direct him in the right direction in spite of himself. And I'll tell you what, I have seen God take care of people that were faithful in just the same way. At the last moment, he took care of them, and he took care of them, and he took care of them. God has been so good to us. We get to the tail end of that 2 Corinthians 9 passage, and the, the passage ends with the verse, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Our giving compared to what God has given to us in Jesus Christ and his life, our giving is nothing compared to what we've been given. 
Thanks be to God for this gift that we can't even put into words. Father, thank you for your word. We pray that it would convict us, that it would comfort us, that it would direct us. Lord, may we each and all of us uh, honor you regularly in our giving, uh, giving as unto you, uh, giving, Lord, uh, with you as our priority, and, uh, Lord, that we would be able to show our thanks to you in that. We thank you for your kind provisions to us. You are good to us beyond measure. We thank you above all else for your son, and we pray it in his name. It's hymn number 400, if you like. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Let's stand together as we sing.